Welcome to the Brokers Lounge with Eddie and Carlo. Disclaimer, the information contained in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into account your personal circumstances. Please head to the show notes if you want to book a free call to discuss your personal situation. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Brokers Lounge. Uh, this week I'm not joined by my usual colleague Eddie, uh, but instead I've got Charlie Williams here from Aspire Advocates. Uh, he's going to be talking all things about the property market and the outlook for the property market here in Victoria. But he's also going to give us some great tips on how to structure your offer and negotiating effectively as well. So Charlie, a very big welcome to you mate and um, thanks for joining us here at the Brokers Lounge. Pleasure. Um, perhaps to get started, it'd be great to hear a little bit about yourself, uh, who Aspire Advocates actually are and what they do. Um, and yeah, and then we'll kick in some questions that are going to fire away at you. Yeah, beautiful. No, thanks for having me. Uh, so personally, myself, I've uh, been in property for a bit over 10 years now. Yeah. Um, uh, I work at Aspire Advocates. Uh, we're a boutique buyer advocacy firm based mm-hmm. in Armadale. Mm-hmm. Um, been in operation for a bit over 10 years now, so okay. um, we know a thing or two about property in Melbourne. You'd hope so after about 10 years, <laughs> correct? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, oh, excellent. Yeah. Very good. Well, we'll jump into it because we've got a few questions that we've got lined up for you. And um, yeah, we just want to keep this as open as we can and mm-hmm. hopefully give all our, our listeners out there a bit of an idea as to what's happening in the property market because it is changing quite rapidly Definitely. and um, yep. everyone's got their views on the, as to where it's all heading and but probably no one's got the crystal ball unfortunately so but let's see if we can um, get through some of this so um, first question I wanted to ask you Charlie was around what's the current state of the property market here in Victoria and uh, property prices here in Melbourne and regional Victoria yep. trending upwards or downwards I, f- I feel like I know the answer but I'd rather hear it from the expert yeah yeah that's a great question um, I think it's, 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 it's not necessarily one market and there's so many markets within markets in Melbourne. So mm-hmm. it really depends on the suburb that you're looking at. Um, I think if you looked regionally, we're seeing a slight uptick in those regional hubs, mm-hmm. uh, places like Geelong, Bendigo, Aubrey Wodonga, Wangaratta, mm-hmm. slight uptick in those sort of regional areas. Um, the peninsula absolutely decimated. Um, it's like a cliff. Yes, we, just going we, we, we've down. had this conversation, haven't we, about yeah. my own yep. beach house? So yeah, yep. not happy about that one. <laughs> Don't sell. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, there's definitely um, yeah. I would say overall, it's uh, uh, plateaued and trending sideways. It's probably the best way to say the okay. market's going. Yeah. yeah. And if we, you know, that's obviously where we're at at the moment. What's what's the projected outlook look like for say the next? Six months to a year. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, probably much of the same kind of trend. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think, uh, yeah. With if you had a crystal ball, with uh, all of the media saying that the rates are going to drop next year, I, I'm thinking it might be later next year, mm-hmm. if at all. Um, but that's not what we want to hear, Charlie. No, no it's not. Not. <laughs> but I'm uh, just try, trying to be cautious. But um, I think that. Um, yeah, I think that it's going to be much of the same. Um, there's new legislation coming in from the rental side of things, which is going to make uh, things slightly more difficult for landlords again. Mm-hmm. Um, and that may you know, re- result in having even more um, investors sell their investment properties. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's going to be a more second rate stock coming to market as well. Okay. All right. So yeah, that was, that was probably going to be my next question around you know, the impact of government policies mm. as such, yep. stamp duty, land tax. Yep. Um, so on that basis, if we see a bit of an influx, or sorry, not an out, uh, probably an outflux of property investors, yep. that'll, what do you think that will do to property prices, apart from the types of properties that will hit the market, but yeah. prices in general? Yeah, yeah. Again, it's it's kind of hard to say. I think it will not be overly positive and I don't want to be negative, mm-hmm. but um, I'm a more of a realist. Yep. Um, and yeah, with, with even more stock coming to market, it's not going to be overly positive. There are, it, it is a silver lining though, because when you have a lot of B grade stock come to market, which is a rental property that's, you know, it's been lived in for a long time by a tenant, they haven't really cared for it. Mm-hmm. Doesn't necessarily get the best result, but if you um, are savvy and know what a really nice renovated period home in that suburb would go for, 
we're just not seeing any of them. So mm. if you um, have the ability to renovate and make it look really nice before you sell it, people flock to it because no one at the moment is selling their beautiful family homes because there's none of them to buy. Okay. So there's an opportunity there, which we are seeing with clients that um, are either savvy or have those skills and have the ability to renovate. Um, yeah, they're getting really good prices for those homes. Okay. Mm. And in terms of Victoria, we're, we're, we're the state that's known for spending lots of money and we've got a bucket load of infrastructure projects going on, you know, yep. railway extensions, highways yep. being built, tunnels here, tunnels there. Yep. Is that essentially going to impact property values here in Melbourne? I think it will. I don't think it'll happen overly quickly, though. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, uh, the, the suburban rail loop, I think, is going to be amazing. Yeah. Um, but I feel like I'll probably have a walking stick by the time it's completed. <laughs> If you're going to have a walking stick, mate, you know that's going to happen to me. That means I'll probably be well and truly gone by then. So, uh, But I think that would be great because it'll, it'll sort of create a big ring around Melbourne and you won't have to go from Hurstbridge to, um, into the CBD to then go out to somewhere like Cheltenham. Okay. They'll be in, in a ring, so it'll make uh, traversing Melbourne a lot easier. I think it'll okay. be really good. Yep. Uh, do you reckon that'll set us uh, apart from other states then based on what they're doing? I think so. Yep. I think it'll be the place to be. Pardon the pun. Whoa, we can have those number <laughs> plates back again with Victoria, the place to be. I yeah, like it. Yeah. Um, and, and would you think that the property market here in Victoria is more favourable to sellers or buyers as we are today? Yep. Um, again, it's a bit of a, a two, two way street with that. If you've got a beautiful, um, family home or a new big family home, um, you're going to do really well if you want to sell it because mm -hmm. there's just not many of them around. So when they come to market, they absolutely fly. Yeah. Um, but there's also um, a lot of opportunity there for buyers because um, we're seeing uh, real estate agents are a lot more inclined to um, sell before auction. Mm -hmm. We've actually got a lot of negotiation going on this minute where we put an offer in prior to auction, which has been accepted um, okay. before auction. We went and I went to uh, an REIV event last week. Um, in the last 12 months, offers prior to auction have gone from 10% to 20%. So, oh, wow. so there's definitely been a, a, a mm. lot more agents wanting to get deals done because I think there are a lot more properties that are not selling or they're passing in and then they're having to put a, a, a sticker price, a single sticker price on the property and then they sit there, yeah. which nobody wants. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's probably the real estate agent's worst nightmare, isn't it? Having it really is. properties yep. sitting on the market for way too long. It, yep. uh, it just gives a real negative story, negative vibe to the, the buyers out there. So, yep. And everyone will sits back and goes, well, if they're sitting there for that long, well, there's a good opportunity here that we might be able to pick it up at a much lower price. So, correct. Yeah. Correct. I wouldn't mind asking you a question that we had in one of our previous podcasts around the the new Victorian government's, it's a temporary measure, I know, with regards to off the plan stamp duty concession. Mm -hmm. um, who do you think will potentially benefit the most? And do you think it'll actually have the desired effect that the government actually wanted it to? Um, considering it's only going to go for 12 months. Mm. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and the cheeky answer is probably I think the most benefit will go to the developers and the builders. Yeah. Um, uh, we we generally don't recommend clients purchase off the plan at all mm -hmm. um, unless it's, yeah, we, we really try to steer them clear of buying off the plan. Uh, we just don't think they're great investments mm -hmm. at all. Um, there'd be a very minor scenario there where you've got a small boutique block in a great location, which is, highly desirable that, that then we may consider, mm -hmm. um, which you could get some growth out of. But if it's just a large high rise where there's three, 400, 500 apartments, um, you're not going to be able to make any money out of it. It may be good for renters, um, the supply of rentals, yep. which may ease the, the rental crisis somewhat. But yeah, I, we generally say to clients, we can find you something better than a brand new yeah. apartment. That, yeah, because it's essentially been the allure of the stamp duty savings that that have drawn people towards these off the plan purchases. But yeah, I think with the way things are going in the construction industry as well, it's uh, there's a lot more nervousness around buying off the plan. Correct. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, 
yeah, we, we try to steer clear of those altogether, unfortunately. That's right. It's not for everyone, that's for sure. So, <laughs> um, And I, I wouldn't mind asking you a question with regards to the expected, and this is purely for investment properties now, mm-hmm. What, what is actually the expected return on investment for rental properties here in Melbourne mm-hmm. and also regional Victoria? Because I know, you know, from a lending point of view, we're typically having to build in servicing calculations and we go, well, the expected rate of return, if we work off, we used to work off three and a half, four percent, it's probably now maybe lower towards the three. I'm not too sure, but I'm mm-hmm. um, keen to hear your thoughts with regards to that. So that's probably part one of my question. Then part two is around, are there any emerging areas here in, Melbourne or even regional Victoria, uh, where you could potentially get much better re- investment returns. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So and we won't hold you to it. We promise. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, I think with regards to um, returns, it, it's it's a sort of a two pronged approach because you've got the yield mm-hmm. and then you've got the growth yep. aspect. So um, if you're looking for growth, there are emerging pockets that you know we we look at. Um, there's places like the Marybeck Council, which is the inner north, sort of your, your Coburg, Coburg North, mm-hmm. potentially a bit of reservoir. I know that's a probably a, a gentrifying suburb, but mm-hmm. um, those sort of pockets are okay in Melbourne. Um, places even like Croydon, Ringwood, those pockets, because okay. you've got Mitcham, Nunawadding, Blackburn, which have, have done really well, and the price point's sort of up towards that 1.5 and above. And mm-hmm. a lot of families can't afford that price point now or the first home buyers are getting pushed out to that next ring so that's yeah your Croydon Fern Tree Gully those pockets are actually doing reasonably well and I mm-hmm. think you know, over the next short to medium term that area m- might actually do quite well mm-hmm. um, and then from a it depends like if you really want a high yield you can go to places like Carlton 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 North yeah. you get an apartment there and you'll get eight nine potentially a ten percent yield but the entry levels yeah, your little one, two hot. betters, but you won't get much growth, unfortunately. So okay. if you want some cash flow, you can do that. It probably wouldn't be uh, our first preference, but um, yeah. And then in, from a regional perspective, again, uh, there's a lot of talk around Cario, which is Geelong, mm-hmm. north of Geelong. Yep. Um, there's places like Kangaroo Flat, which is in Bendigo, mm-hmm. um, pockets like that. You can get your 4 to 5% yields potentially a 6% yield if you you know what you're looking for and you buy it well. Mm-hmm. Um, even places like Wangaratta. And again, you've got to look at you know the areas in that town to make sure you're buying in the area where owner occupiers want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where you can you can get some good good yields. And okay. even Wodonga as well. Um, mm-hmm. I think you're still getting a slight uptick and you'll get a reasonable amount of growth and a decent yield you're not going to get you can't have a really good yield and massive growth they don't mm-hmm. really go together if you if you did everyone would buy them it's kind of like a unicorn so to speak yeah mm. yeah the yeah uh, the one that everyone's looking for but yeah. never ex- actually exists so correct um what we might do is um change tack a little bit here now and just talk a little bit more around probably more suited towards what you actually do in your day-to-day job, yep. um, and that's obviously helping clients locate properties, put in offers for properties, mm-hmm. negotiate on their behalf, etc. So, uh, I guess my first question to you, as as a professional buyer's advocate, how do you go about structuring an offer that is different to say myself? You yep. know, I, I haven't engaged you, and I'm just going to an auction or even a private sale and wanting to buy an investment property or even an owner occupier. You know, I would typically think I know. The, the best way to do it, but I almost guarantee that it's probably far, far from it. So yep. how do you go about structuring that a little bit differently? Yeah, I, well, I think it, it initially starts off with having a good relationship with the agent. I think um, people think that the agents, you know, and, and buyer advocates aren't, you know, friends, mm-hmm. but um, we have lots of great relationships with lots of agents all over Melbourne. They're essentially the conduit to the vendor. Mm. So they're there to help us. Um, and we're there. We all want the same result. Um, we want it to sell. The vendor wants it to sell. We want to purchase. So we're there to work with the agent, not necessarily against the agent. So the first thing we like to do is speak to the agent three, four, five times um, to get some inside information. Mm-hmm. And the agents will generally give us a little more information than they will to a layperson because they've probably dealt with this before. Yeah. 
Um, they know that we mean business. Uh, we're a serious buyer. So they generally tell us a little more information. Um, and so things we would ask them are, what's the situation with the vendor? Um, you know, why are they selling it? Um, what sort of settlement terms do they want? Um, and we can use that information in structuring our offer. So if they say, oh, look, we really want a, our vendors want a long settlement because, you know, they've got to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and so we, we will use that information um, in the part of the, our negotiation. So, for example, when we're putting the offer together, we may say something like, um, hello, Mr. Agent, um, we're prepared to pay $800,000 with a short settlement. Mm -hmm. um, and the agent will come back to us and go, no, 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 no. We need more money and we need a longer settlement. Our client doesn't matter. They don't care about the settlement. So yeah. what we do there is the agent comes back to us and says that and we say, we're not gonna give you any more money, but we will give you that longer settlement. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've, what we do there is we've used a, a low value item to, to, to affect a sale potentially because you've got to give a little bit to get yep. a bit. So we're not giving any money away, but we're giving them the settlement that, they, that, that, that is their preference. So that's one way we can um, negotiate. Mm -hmm. um, another way you can structure an offer is if you want to purchase it before auction, which is great and what we're doing at the moment. Um, I'll give you a live example. We've got a client looking in, we won't say the exact suburb, but um, let's just call it uh, Vermont, for example. and we know that the value of the property is about 1.5. Mm -hmm. The auction's tomorrow at 11 a.m. We've gone to the agent and said, we want to buy this property. Where do we need to be? And there's not a lot of confidence in the market. They're saying, look, if you're somewhere towards the top of the range, we, we, we'd probably have a crack at it. Mm. So we've put an offer of 1.3 with a 24-hour deadline. It's very important to put a deadline on it. So yeah. you're putting, applying a little, little bit of pressure. Yep. So we generally put a 24-hour deadline on it. That deadline finishes today at 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. And so if they don't accept that offer, we said, if you don't accept this offer, we are not coming to the auction tomorrow. We're pursuing another property. Yeah. So we're not going to be there tomorrow. Um, so that applies more pressure. So for anyone out there, always put a deadline on your offer. So put a 24-hour deadline on your offer. Um, it definitely helps you and puts a little bit of pressure on the vendor to go, oh, should we go to auction? Should we just take this offer now? Mm. We know that if it gets to auction and it could be a competitive situation, uh, it could easily sell for 1.5. That's where we're seeing value. Yeah, it's, it, it amazes me. Like the real estate game, is a lot of it's about mind games, isn't it? Mm -hmm. In terms of yep. who, who's the first one to, to speak literally ends up losing the deal. So, yep. um, but it, it really comes back to, and the same as what we talk about in the mortgage broker space as well, is that engaging the right professionals mm. will typically help you you know, steer the negotiations in the right directions and your relationships with the real estate agents definitely helps out because, you know, for myself, I go there and look at a property, I'll go, well, their range is from this to this um, and the agent will, can tell you whatever they want to tell you and mm. you're none the wiser because I'm not an expert when it comes to real estate. I don't know what other offers are out there. So, um, yeah, I can definitely see the benefit of where you guys are taking a lot of that burden off buyers mm. who don't want to be get caught up in those type of negotiations. I, I couldn't yep. think of anything worse, to be absolutely honest. I'm, I'm glad it's you, mate, not me. That's for <laughs> I sure. I think, yeah, I think on that as well, Carlo, like it's 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 one thing to note that we don't get emotionally involved. Mm -hmm. It's it's a business to business transaction for us. So there's no emotion. Whereas if you really like a home and the agent knows that you like it, yeah, they can drag you up. Whereas we can be like, nah, this is our limit. Take it or leave it or see you later. Yeah. Oh, very good. Okay, Charlie, um, next question I had for you was around buying at auction because it can be daunting for the everyday buyer out there. And sometimes I think selling at an auction is almost more daunting than buying at an auction, but we'll just concentrate on the on the buyers for now. But um, what do you guys actually do differently? Do, like, do you, I know your preference is to try and purchase a property for your clients before auction, but say it does go to auction and they're engaging you to negotiate at the auction itself. Mm -hmm. What advantages do you guys have compared to someone like myself at the on the day of auction? Yep, yep, yeah, no, great question. So the property's not worth more anymore on the day of the auction mm -hmm. as it is the day before the auction. Yep. So what we like to do with the client is 
set a budget before the auction mm -hmm. and we ask them, here's where we're seeing value, this is market value, and this is a range we don't want to pay. Mm -hmm. So where do you guys want to be? This is our walkway price. So if it goes for 650, are you happy to let it go? Yeah. And we set that budget before the auction. So we're not, we never overpay for property at auction and we're happy to let properties go if they do get to an emotional range. So as part of your process when clients engage you is to do that market analysis yep. and do a lot of prep work leading up to the day of potentially putting in an offer or going to auction that the client should have absolutely no hesitation in terms of setting that desired or that maximum amount because they know there's a lot of research that's gone into it as well so correct yep and we use um i guess a, a methodology that's similar to how a, a real estate agent values property mm -hmm. and then we overlay how a, a, um, a valuer values property and we use the same software mm -hmm. so um yeah it's kind of uh there's a few different elements to valuing property but the main one is probably the land size mm -hmm. uh the house size and then the condition of the home um, it even can come down to the home's orientation. Okay. So a, a north orientation is the most desirable, followed by a west. Mm -hmm. And that's just got to do with the sun and the way the sun falls. So yeah. if you're in, the, in the afternoons, if you've got a west-facing rear, you can be sitting in the backyard with a beer or having a barbecue and watch the sun go down. So people do occasionally pay a premium for, for that kind of asset. Mm -hmm. So we do take that in, into consideration. Yep. Okay, excellent. Yep. And we all know some price, uh, some properties out there are priced at times quite aggressively. And then there's also some that are a little bit more realistically. You know, how do you value a property accurately to set a client's budget as such? Yep, yep. So again, going back to uh, block size is the most important. There is a law of diminishing returns in some areas where if you do have really, really large blocks on the peninsula, mm -hmm. uh, you know, four acres might be similar to six acres but in in a melbourne like if you've got an 800 square meter block versus a 1200 square meter block in surrey hills 1200 square meter block is substantially more valuable than the 800 mm -hmm. so yeah again uh square meter rates block sizes uh house size house condition location proximity to shops transport um, and so we, yeah, we, we run through that and we'll, we'll box it in. So we'll find two properties that are on the same size land, but not as good condition. Uh, and, and then put them as two inferior. We'll find two that are, have sold recently in the last six, nine, maybe 12 months if we can't find anything that's similar. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll have them as two that are comparable. And then we'll find two that are clearly superior properties so you'll have two inferior two comparable and then two superior and we just box it in and you know you can sort of tell a client well which one would you prefer um and that's sort of where you find that limit of yeah. where the value is yeah yeah and i know with investment properties there's typically it's just raw numbers at the end of the day because it's it's a numbers game you just want to make sure that the deal works best for the clients itself yeah but if you're looking to purchase a property on behalf of your clients for them to actually live in mm -hmm. do you have an element of emotional buffer attached to to maximum prices you do um and an example of that is a beautiful californian bungalow home on the same size land mm. as a, an ugly clinker brick yeah you're going to place more value on that californian bungalow mm -hmm. and it's going to be the same when you go to sell it so if you've got an ugly clinker brick on the same size internally it's similar condition but if you've got a beautiful facade people will just fall in love with them mm. and they will pay a premium for them. So you can allow a slight more um, of a budget for those kind of homes because mm -hmm. yeah, when you go to sell it, people go, oh, it's a California bungalow or yeah. it's a beautiful federation home. So you can allow an extra buffer there to, to secure a home of, of that quality. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, I agree. And sorry, Carly, just to circle back to the auction process, mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to touch on when we're actually at the auction. So when we get to an auction, we like to survey the scene. Mm -hmm. um, and once you've been to a few auctions, you can tell who's gonna bid and who's not gonna bid. Yeah. Um, and there's telltale signs everywhere. So if, you're, if they're tapping their feet or their hands on their face like this, or if they cross their arms, it generally means that they're very, very nervous and they've got something to hide. Yeah. 
Um, so when we I, I used up, to cross my arms so my wife wouldn't grab my arm and put the arm up. So that was the reason why I used to do that. So. <laughs> That's also a good way to keep you out of it. But yeah, they're, they're telltale ways we can rock up to an auction and go, he's going to bid, that couple's going to bid. They're definitely going to bid. Um, and then you can, you can work out your strategy on the fly mm-hmm. um, if it's going to be competitive. Um, and there's certain strategies you may use. Let's just say that the quotes one, two, one, three, mm-hmm. um, and we know it's good buying up to one, four. Um, they've quoted it aggressively, you might say. Um, and we would employ- They push the envelope and it comes to quote Yes, quoting. correct, yes. correct. We would employ a strategy there where you um, do what's called jumping the bidding. Mm-hmm. So you would start at one, two, um, and then go straight to one, two, five straight to one three. So someone else bids 10,000 on top of you, you're bidding a large increment on top of them. But we know that the value is up at one four. Yeah. So it, nothing that happens below the reserve means anything. So we like to use the analogy of putting sticks onto a fire. And so at a normal auction, if someone like me is not there, you'll get a $1,000 bid or a $10,000 bid there and the sticks keep to grow and the fire builds. And that's when you mm. get the emotional momentum and then everyone starts bidding. We want to avoid that at all costs Mm. to actually save our clients money. So what we do is rather than these sticks being added onto the fire, we'll come in and just go boom and drop a big log on it, which extinguishes. Pour some kerosene on it and just really blow it up. (laughs) But that that extinguishes the the heat of the auction, so to speak. Um, And it it sort of kills the momentum that, um, yeah, some auctions can have. It takes the heat out of it. It's interesting because like, that's, that's a great way to understand the auction process and how you guys analyze the audience. For me, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm similar in the sense that I like auctions purely because you, because you can see what your competition looks like. Mm-hmm. These private sales or sale by set dates, really difficult because you you've you been asked to put in your best offer mm. um, and you've got a final date to submit it by, but then you don't know whether there's a Dutch auction going on behind the scenes. I don't know if these are, that's even legal in Victoria, but um, yeah. Yeah, I think once you've spoken to enough agents, you can work out if there is enough other offer or if mm. there isn't. And then if they, if they say they've got another offer, you can ask them questions like, oh, so who is the upper from? What's their family like? And they, if they have a really good backstory to it, you can, yeah. you can, you can tell that it's genuine or sometimes they might, they might, oh, oh, oh. And then you know that it could be a, a bluff. So yeah. to speak, yeah. yeah, it's a good lesson. You've got to engage the right people. And we've been banging on about this for a long time around getting the right team around you. You know, obviously the Link Wealth Group, financial planning, getting the right type of advice. Exactly. Yep. Uh, you know, linking up with myself as a mortgage broker, make sure obviously you get those pre-approvals done. Don't exactly. just let Charlie go and bid in <laughs> for properties that you've got a pre-approval for. So. Um, but yeah, it definitely, all, if you have the right team around you, you can easily achieve the right result. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know. Well, probably less chance of paying too much. Correct. Well, we won't, we won't pay too much because we'll just let it go. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, there's all, there'll always be more properties and there'll be off-market properties as well that we can get access to and where you won't have that competitive situation at all. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Very good. All right, I'm going to ask you one more question because... I, I've obviously seen the benefit of working with a buyer's agent, not for myself personally, but for clients. And, and we quite often do it when we've got clients that are buying through their self-managed super fund. So we definitely know the advantages, but it's probably a good opportunity for yourself to tell the audience in terms of, you know, what's the biggest advantages of working with you mm-hmm. in terms of locating and buying a property? Yeah, no, great question. So. In hundred uh, words or less, just yeah, hundred words or less. <laughs> I always say uh, that to Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think there's there's sort of three or four main advantages that we offer to clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, firstly, would be advice, advice on what to buy. Yep. But more importantly, what not to buy. There's a lot of lemons yeah. out there. Yep. So that would be the first advantage. We we say no to a hell of a lot of property before we find one, and we go, oh, actually, this one actually looks pretty good. We mm-hmm. should have a crack at this okay. one. So advice is yep. the first one. Uh, secondly, uh, negotiation skills. So most real estate agents um, sell a property every seven to 10 days. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people looking do it every seven to 10 years. Yeah. So they're simply better at it than you. Yeah. And we know all their tips and tricks and what they say and why they say it. And they will gather information on a buyer and say, oh, 
uh, did you see the one around the corner? And they're not doing that to be nice. Mm. Say the one around the corner is listed for 800 and you're looking at properties that are 700. They now know that you've got 800 to spend. Yeah. So they will, if you are interested in the $700,000 property, they'll drag you up to 800 because they know that you've got that extra money to spend. Yep. Yep. And then I think it's the third thing would be um, probably around uh, looking at property itself. So we look at, um, I think on average, 50 to 60 properties per client before we find one that's suitable. Wow. Um, so we're looking at a lot of property. Mm. Uh, we do what's called a property tour mm -hmm. where we look at between six to eight properties. Some of these will be on market, some will be off market. They'll all be within the client's budget and we'll work towards probably a Thursday where we inspect one after the other. Um, it will be there for 20 minutes, go to the next one. So we'll look at eight properties in a morning sort of thing. Um, and one of three things generally happens after that is they'll say, hey, Charlie, we love number four. We want to buy it. And mm. then we go into our negotiation phase where we accurately value the property and then set a budget and work towards buying that as far below that budget as possible. Um, sometimes clients will go, oh, we love the location of number two, but the accommodation of number five. And then we really know what the client wants and we can sharpen up their brief. And that's when we get um, really good access to those off-market properties and mm. we call all the agents and say, hey, you know that one you sold around the corner? Do you have anything similar? And they go, oh, actually, yeah. I just They've always got one sitting in the wings. They've always got one sitting, in the, wing, got one sitting in the wings, <laughs> yeah. And we can just sneak through and um, yep. snap it up before it comes to market. So yeah. they're some of the main advantages, I would say. Um, yeah. Very good. Well, I think we've, um, we've gone through uh, the bulk of it now. So um, I just wanted to say a very big thank you to yourself, Charlie. And um, your insights into the property market here in Victoria is, is uh, really appreciated. Um, the, but the tips around, you know, structuring offers and negotiating properties, uh, hopefully the, the listeners out there will find it very insightful and very helpful, most importantly as well. So um, thank you once again. No, I appreciate it. Thanks for and, having um, me. Yeah, until next time, we'll, uh, we'll sign off from here and um, obviously continue to keep dropping us lots of comments and notes and, and give us lots of questions as well. Uh, subscribe to our podcast and um, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks very much, everyone.